All right. Well, welcome back, everybody. Science of Diving Workshop 4. We got a virtual, really uh, an equipment shop tour tonight that's going to be um, it's going to be our sessions and then we'll have the uh, after party where we can answer questions. Hopefully you guys are getting closer to uh, finishing up the science of diving specialty. So if there are things any through any of those modules, we can uh, we can try to help you out. All right. So here's where we are. We were looking at the various sections of the science of diving and you can kind of see the progression that we've had. <clears throat> so the um, the section that that uh, really section four talks about is the components of the total diving system. So we were looking at it and we said, hmm, here's all of the different topics that they were talking about. And, you know, we could have prepared presentations to um, entertain all of you with, um, you know, the, the great knowledge that we possess, but we thought it might be more fun to take all of that and just turn it into this. <laughs> We'll just do the virtual equipment shop tour with Don Abel and uh, Rusty, Don Irvine, and um, they're going to cover all those points for you live and be able to show you the equipment that, um, that you use in your dives and um, <clears throat> really maybe develop an appreciation, a better appreciation of, of what that um, system is, how it works, and how we can take care of it. So um, with that, Don, I'm going to... Um, Unshare my screen, but these are these are the topics that uh, that you'll be able to maybe um, follow Don through with this, and um, we'll come back to this slide maybe later and just review it and make sure that we um, that we caught everything. But to allow Don's screen to be bigger, which Don, you're going to have to unmute yourself because I muted everybody. <clears throat> I will stop sharing and take it away, Don. Maybe I'll unmute Don. Yeah, why don't you unmute? There, I got, I got it. Okay. You're good. All right. I want. Can you guys hear me now? We can. All right. Welcome to shop night equipment, scuba equipment night with me and Rusty. Let me first start out with saying that neither Rusty nor I are IT guys, nor are Rusty and I movie stars. So we're going to go from there. Um, we're going to start out with air supply going from the compressor to your cylinder. All right, so we, we fill a little different than some shops. We don't fill off a cascade, we fill right from the compressor, filled with seven whips, um, and from there it goes up. Sometimes you're gonna hear the word hot fill. If somebody hot fills a tank, what they're saying is they're filling the tank really fast. All right, and that's gonna build up heat on the cylinder, and if that pressure starts out at like, 3,200 coming off from the compressor, the tank is gonna be 3,200 hot. When it cools down, it might be 29, 2,800 PSI. Those laws and everything come back to, I think Megan had that chapter and stuff like that. So we'll talk, if you have questions on that later, we can explain any of those. All right, so the cylinders are, are all filled and everything like that. We filled anywhere, we filled like the steel or the aluminum, 80, 63, 72s, they all fill the same. We're filling these with yolk. Most of our stuff is all yolk. We do have a way to fill in as well. So now we're gonna come over here and talk a little bit more about the cylinders. So we're gonna start out looking at how we inspect the cylinders. All right. The cylinders, every cylinder has to be visited every year. So this one has a viz sticker on it. And every five years, they're hydro. All right. And then they're hydro. So they have a born on date. So this tank was born the third month of the 16th year. All right. This is an aluminum tank. If you look down in there, Russ is going to get us the camera. You can look down in there. That tank looks beautiful. Let me put that camera on. It's right on the All right. A little hard to see, but not bad. So that tank is a, in really good shape. Then we have a steel tank here that's a little older. And with this tank, you'll see there's some corrosion in there. You'll see the rust and stuff like that. That tank would not pass. 
that tank would need to be tumbled and cleaned and probably still wouldn't pass. So that's how we look and how we do the inspections on the tanks. For the threads, we use something like this and we really look at the threads because that's the part of the tank that's getting stressed the most. Then we talk a little bit quick about valves. All right. So you have a couple of different kinds of valves. The valve here, first valve, this is what we mean by DIN. You can see the, the threads. So instead of your regulator going over it like a yoke, this the thread, the, the regulator would thread in. This is your regular yoke style valve. This is an old fashioned J valve. They're still around, they still use them quite a bit. What would happen there is the tank would start to get harder to breathe and then you flip it down and it's gonna give you enough air to get to the surface, old style stuff. We don't sell them, they don't make them anymore. So some of the things and some of the parts of the valve, you have the stem of the valve. These are all a couple, three different kinds of stems. What happens here with the stems are when you drop the tank, this is what you bend or break is usually the stem. This nut here is what holds the handle on. These are the ones that usually loosen up because there's a spring in there. If you hear somebody say you overfill the tank and you're gonna blow the burst disc, this is a burst disc. So like why we don't fill the tanks to 3,600 PSI to give you more air is because we don't want you to take it home, leave it in your car on a hot day and blow the burst disc. O-rings, a lot of O-rings in scuba diving, two different kinds. There's Vicon O-rings. We use these with the nitrox and any kind of mixed gas. And then we use the regular rubber O-rings for everyday stuff. This is the plug which changes the din to yoke. Half of our tanks, I would say, are have the plug in them. So we can, if somebody's running from us or something, we can switch them back and forth. All right, um, we're gonna head to the repair shop. We'll start taking apart some regulators on the way there. We'll, so if we were to do a tumble in a tank, we have a tank tumbler here. For the aluminum tanks, we use these little wedges. And you put out two, three cups in the tank, let it run for about 20 minutes, cleans up the oxidation. And then for the steel tanks, we use the little triangles, pods, same thing, two or three cups in the steel tank. Again, you're only you're gonna run it for about a half an hour because they're so abrasive that they'll actually take the wall of the cylinder away. So we can answer questions later. So we All right, now I'm going to take this and put it above. We will start with our first stage regulator. So we have a first stage regulator here. This is yoke. We're gonna take off the, the adjustment nut. It's gonna stop wiggling in a minute. Hope that's good. Take off the, end, the adjustment nut. This is our dust cap. Take that. Inside here, we have the filter. Everything's been pre-loosened. They're all tarked down to certain specs. So that's the yoke valve, or the yoke. Here we have already a bad O-ring. So we would take our O-ring remover, we slide that O-ring off, set that off to the side. The filter gets pulled, the snap ring for that. The filter gets poked out. Behind the filter, we have a little spring. There's a little spring. That part's ready for the ultrasonic cleaner. Now we come over to the high pressure side, high pressure chamber. High pressure chamber. It's open.
high pressure chamber. So you have your poppet. You have your poppet. That's an ATC poppet. Then there's tri material poppets, your spring, and your push point. And inside each one of these, off. Inside of each one of these, there are two or three little more of the, lots and lots of little O rings. All right, so there's one more O ring. I'm not getting it out right now. So we're going to set that aside. So lots of springs, lots of O-rings, lots of pieces. So that's your high pressure side of your thing. And there's a needle. Didn't come out yet. Then we're gonna go on to this side. This is what's the difference on this is where you become balanced and unbalanced regulator. These are this is a balanced regulator. Unbalanced regulator is a regulator that isn't going to breathe as well when the cylinder gets lower on air, or as you get deeper, it's going to breathe harder. Um, not a lot of unbalanced regulators out there. It's a lot of different kind of regulators out there. And if you look at them and you think about it, most of them all fit in your hand. They all pretty much are either yoke or dent. So regulator from one company to the next doesn't make a lot of difference. You have to look at other pieces of it, repair kits, um, who's repairing what in your area, things like that. So we'll go back to that. So what this would do, this nut, is how I adjust your intermediate pressure, which Donnie's going to show us here in a minute when we're done with our regulators. So you take that off, the adjustment. Then from there, you have the spring. And this is a diaphragm, not a piston regulator. I can show you a piston later if you want to see it. Push pad for the spring, retaining clip, our diaphragm. When we doing this, we're looking for any kind of holes or anything like that, any real wear. You can see where the spring pads kind of pushed on it on the one side, and then on this side, you have the poppet, which is going to push up and down as well. And then, no. While Don's doing this, I'm just going to add, don't try this at home. Yes, please don't. <laughs> or feel free to take it apart at home, bring all your bits to Don, and we'll sell you a new regulator. Yeah. The seat doesn't want to come out of this one. This is what I run into when it's just a regular night and everything's been a part on this one already too. <laughs> so the seat's still in there. The seat doesn't want to come out. It's at an angle. I can see it right now. If I push it back down, it'll come out. Don had to recently update his procedures. He's no longer licking each of these parts before he puts them back yes. in the regulator. <laughs> so that is our first stage regulator, all apart, ready to go into the ultrasonic cleaner. And this one's been pretty well taken care of. There's no real corrosion or anything like that. In a few minutes, we'll show you a couple that are corroded. And it doesn't just get corroded by salt water. It also can get corroded by our fresh water. Um, there's a couple different ways that regulators can get corroded. So that is the first stage regulator. All right, kind of throw some of these parts over here. Hopefully I can remember how to put it back together. So. So this is our second stage. So the air has come out of this and it's dropped off from the lower pressure side, not the high pressure side. The only thing that you're using on the high pressure side is going to be your gauges, um, where your computer monitor will go, stuff like that. And then on this side here is the low pressure side, which would be your inflator for your BCD, your regulator, your alternate air source, um, octo, and stuff like that. So we take off the cover. 
we have the diaphragm, we have the retaining clip in their diaphragm. Diaphragms can end up with little holes in them. This will give you a little bit of wetness in your mouth. That knows that that has a bed. The other thing that'll give you wetness in the mouth as you're doing your dive would be the exhaust valve wasn't put back in correctly or the exhaust valve is got an angle to it or it's torn. This is your exhaust valve. So you inhaled the air, the air came in, in here through, this lever goes up and down by the diaphragm. What happens is you're gonna suck it in and then when you go to exhale, your air is coming back out and your air is going out here. Pretty good with the mouth, huh? All right, so on these, these prestige ones, which I really like, we use a lot for classes, is it has the dive, so it's open, and then it has, when it's flipped up like that, it's the no dive. And what that does is it keeps that lever from going down. All right, with these, if you can see this, these cards are set so the how where that lever needs to be when we're actually putting it back together. All right, so right now that lever is really high. So when we're tuning these and we're getting them to where they want to be before we put them on the machine, we're actually, hold on one second, I'm trying to get it so I can see it and you can see it. So see here, see that lever is moving? I hope you can see that. We set it in the shop here before we put it on the methyl so we can do it. What that does is you've heard of a free flow before or you've had a free flow, mostly over divers. And the free flow is that the air is just escaping. All the air is going out. Usually you'll either have most instructors say, flip your regulator over. So what that's doing is it's taking the pressure off from the diaphragm or they'll put it in your mouth and take a breath. That's taking the pressure off from this diaphragm, which is making a free flow. When we set these in the shop, we set them for about three inches of water. And you say, well, how do you do that? Don's gonna show us that in a minute when we, when we do the intermediate pressure, we'll also show you how we set, how much air we're actually, what the cracking pressure they use the word is for that. All right, so then you have your mouthpiece. You Even as you're diving or you're going, before you're going on a trip or something, these really tend to right in here, in this part of the, of the mouthpiece, you wanna look for cracks. Lately, I don't care what brand the mouthpiece it is, they seem to check up and crack really easy. So that's one of those things that you, you wanna put in your save a dive kit and you wanna have an extra mouthpiece around, all right? So now we're gonna go in, we're gonna take this apart, lever housing. So this is when we were, when I was screwing this in to adjust the lever, this is what I'm adjusting right here, this green piece. It's how high and how low. What that does is it sits in this seat. I'm trying to get that. And you can see this seat is worn really bad. So what's, what we try to do to save some money and save the customers money, believe it or not, that's not in, in the repair kits. So what I'll do is I'll flip that out and I'll flip it over the first time and then I'll put a new one in the second time. See, on that side, it's still, there's no wear to it. This side, you can see the wear. You guys are either hating me or liking me right now. <laughs> All right, so that's gonna be the pin, uh, pin cushion, I call it. All right, and then what this does is now that slides out into the chamber, all right, we take our nut, get back the nut off, And then that there would all go into the ultrasonic cleaner as well. And it would get cleaned. Everything checked for damaged and then put back together. So that is pretty simple and there's not a lot going on there, but there's enough and it has to be all put back together and tuned just right. So you have that, 
All right, so let me push that aside, trying not to overly do it. Now we're gonna get into the BCD inflator. You probably don't think that there's a lot going on in here, but there really is. And especially if you have the Air 2 or, um, what's the other one called? Jimmy, help me out there. The air control. Air an, control, thank an, you. An integrated power inflator and alternate Perfect. air source. Thank you. So we take the mouthpiece off or where you would in, orally inflate. And then from there we also, this has, believe it or not, even this has a little filter and there's another O-ring. All right. There's this filter. If you can see it, that white thing is our filter. Let me pop this up. Springs go flying everywhere. So what that does is that takes that out. That comes out another O ring. And all the crazy specialized There's tools. Our filter. There's the little filter. the chamber from the chamber now that that holds that in. that would all go in the ultrasonic cleaner chamber would come apart and you if you start to think about it there's an o-ring here o-ring there Another O-ring there, another one there, two there, that's a double, and one here. So there is still quite a bit of moving parts. So when you're doing, I get a lot of people that'll bring me their regulators and say, hey, geez, I need to have my reg service. I get about one in 10 that'll bring me a BCD and say, how, what do I do there, and this and that. And it really, all it takes is a little piece of sand or something like that, and the BCD is leaking and it's all of a sudden like this O-ring here will let a lot go by. So it's just as important to get that BCD serviced as it is to get your reg serviced. All right. Okay, so now we're gonna talk, we're gonna switch over back to Rusty, our cameraman. We're gonna talk about, first we're gonna talk about the intermediate pressure. So the intermediate pressure from all the manufacturers we're setting it about one between 125 you see here and 150. Hey Don, you're a little bit muted right now. Line right in the middle. All right. Hey Don. So that that is set. There we go. And remember now that's set back on this nut on the very top. So I can adjust that to get it right where I want it. So now it's right where I want it. So that's your intermediate pressure. And that's gonna be what is flowing to the first stage or the second stage regulator right here. All right. So this here, now we're gonna go up here to the magnet heel and it's gonna tell us how many inches of water this regulator is gonna crack at. Cracking means, so as I'm sitting here, hold on me one second. Oh, we just lost some. Back? Okay. Okay. So cracking pressure is going to be as I go like that, and it's, I can feel the air from the cylinder start to give me air. That's going to be the cracking pressure. So about three inches of water, which is which is perfect. That's just where I want it to be, considering that's my set of rights. <laughs> So that, that kind of gives us a quick overloop of how we set that, what the intermediate pressure does, the difference between the high pressure regulator or the, the balanced regulator and the unbalanced. Um, pretty much all of our parts here for our first and second stage and our inflator, that would all go into, we can take a walk over here to the ultrasonic cleaner. 
that would all go over here to the ultrasonic cleaner. And it would, we usually, probably about 20 minutes of washing and then let it dry, rinse it really good, let it dry, start putting everything back together. Um, definitely, if I see O-rings that are bad, new kit for sure of O-rings and stuff, the, the manufacturers give you great opportunities and stuff like that. Everything's packaged really well together, so it's easy to do. I'm gonna have Dave show you a couple of pictures. We're gonna start with the saltwater pictures, Dave. All right, hang on. You have those, you can bring that stuff up. Here we go, let's go over here. That kind of shows you right there. That's the airflow, the how the that leaf, the leaf one's a little bit different. And this mathematical is exactly where we're coming up with the cracking pressure and that cracking pressure. All right. Next video, their next picture, Dave. All right. So in the middle here, we have what I call freshwater corrosion. That's, that's mainly what we're gonna see in, in our area is that freshwater corrosion. Um, so that's what I see a lot of. I see it in the first stage and the second stage. Here's a really good example. And then the people that are traveling, you're seeing the saltwater corrosion on these ones. This is, this is stuff that I've seen over the years. So we have that, all right? So if it comes in like that, these pieces would be condemned the freshwater stuff I usually can clean up, but the housing here, depending on how bad the pitting was, that would be a judgment by, by me. Um, other than that, I think that we are good. We will turn it over back over to Jim. Did you want to show that stuff on the ice regulator or do you still have that? Sure, I, I do. Let me, uh, Dave, let me... Uh, let me take over for a second here and I will share my screen. So uh, let's see, where is she? Screen three. Okay. Let me move everyone's picture out of the way and sharing. Um, so uh, Don wanted me to talk a bit about um, regulators and different types of regulators. So um, first of all, any regulator on the market nowadays is safe. Right. So the longer, you know, I've done this and, and Don, tell me if you agree, longer I've, I've, I've done the scuba stuff, I found more and more things are the same. You know, so there's, you know, inside of the regulator is going to be basically the same regardless of manufacturer. Right. And you agree, Don? Definitely agree that, you know, it's, it's a hard thing is that all the manufacturers only have so much room to, to maneuver and to work. And a lot of them are the same. I mean, when we take them apart, you'll see a lot. Even on even on this even on this full face regulator here, that that second stage isn't much different than the second stage we just took apart. You have a few extra knobs and things like that, but all in all, they're doing the same thing, and you and you have so much room to work in. So to say that one regulator is better than another, it's more how it feels to you, how light it is things like that, that make more of a difference. Yeah. And, and so, um, but there are some, some regs that are designed for particularly harsh conditions, right? So like when people come to us and they say, Hey, I'm thinking about buying a regulator. The, the first thing we'll say is what type of diving do you like to do? And a lot of times when, when people first start diving and they don't know, right? So we said, just, just grab some rental for a while, figure it out. Right. So on an extreme example, um, which I'm going to uh, show you, um, there's uh, the regulators designed to go under the ice. Right. So this particular one, because I have access to uh, to the information and uh, I believe my screen is sharing. Correct. We see a document. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, so this is one. Those, it's just me Amari's regulator. Um, and it was one that the Navy has approved for cold water operations. Mm -hmm. So think about um, military missions under the ice in Antarctica. So not like what our lake is now, but 29 degree water um, with heavy breathing. And so there are, there's a, a part of the Navy called the Experimental Diving Unit that does the testing on, on regulators. 
And if they can't find a off the shelf regulator uh, that meets their needs, what they'll do is they'll build things themselves, but they're trying not to do that. So I thought this would be interesting to share to, to show you the type of testing uh, that's done. So this is a 30 some page document, 32 page document. So here's a picture of a regulator, right? If you notice that first stage, boy, that looks awfully similar to what Don just ripped apart, doesn't it, right? Um, the difference is the other side. I actually have one, it's, it's Bill's. Um, well, I haven't seen Bill in a while, but it's, it's Bill's that I, I can actually show you. The, the difference here is remember the top when Don was adjusting with the wrench to set the intermediate pressure? That portion is open to seawater, right? What the cold water regulator does is cover that. There's a cold water kit that sits on top of that, right? Um, and then uh, there's a rubber hose here, right? Most regulators nowadays won't have a rubber hose. They'll have a flexible hose called a MyFlex hose. But when you're dealing with extremely cold water temperatures, right, the rubber hose provides better uh, basically throughput of air because the air doesn't hit the rough sides of the tube and spin around, right? And then here's the, the first stage, right? Um, there's a metal regulator body. The one that, that Don showed you was plastic. Well, when you exhale, your body's warm. The metal will capture that heat and transfer it to keep things warmer, right? And it may not sound like much, but when you're diving in 29 degree water, breathing very quickly, there's a Venturi effect that'll happen that'll drop the temperature inside the regulator even more. So all those little things make a difference, right? Um, and uh, uh, the reason I think, Bill, that you are interested in a cold water regulator is that you had a perfectly fine regulator that served you fine up to the point where you went diving in, uh, I forget the water Tobamori. temperatures. Tobamori. Tobamori, right. <laughs> right. And the regulator did what a regulator does when it gets really cold is it free float. It gave, it gave Bill air. It also, I would say Bill handled a, uh, a free flowing regulator at depth in cold water extremely well. And when we went up together, in fact, you know, you said you were fine. I think it, it hit you, you know, a few minutes later when you're back in the boat saying, I just had an emergency here, right? So the idea is that this regulator would reduce the chance of free flowing. So in this particular test, there's three phases. Uh, one is uh, exactly what Don talked about, cracking pressure. So they study all the commercial regulators, right, of what their cracking pressure would be, and then they measure the amount of effort at various levels of pressure in the tank, and at very sim various simulated depths of how much work it, it takes to breathe. And there's a, there's a weird unit of measurement that I think you've heard uh, Don say about inches of water. And so if you take a regulator, the second stage, put it upside down and start, submit, or start putting it down the water, it's going to start free flowing. Have you ever had that happen to your regulator on the surface? Right? Because you're hitting the cracking pressure of the regulator. So they study that. They then put it in ridiculously cold long-term uh, testing, uh, and then they go uh, within an actual machine simulating breathing, right? And so I, I won't go through everything here, right? Um, but they, they just talk about the machine they use to test and, and all of that. Um, and they give all this thing. And then what comes out of this is a graph. Here it is. This is, you may see this, a, a lot of, uh, of the dive, manu dive equipment manufacturers will advertise their regulators in terms of work of breathing, and they'll show you a chart like this. You know, almost everybody can have a chart like this if you control the temperature <laughs> and the rate of breathing, right? So this, this is what looks like an ideal, an ideal work of breathing, right? So there, it's misleading, it's marketing, it, it's more about what's the regulator designed for. So there's the Navy service bench, etc. This I thought is the interesting bit. That is the regulator. That's the first stage of the regulator on the simulated breathing machine where it is so cold it has formed ice around it and the regulator is still working. <laughs> right? Because that regulator is designed for cold water. Now you're never going to get that in the real world, right? Here's the second stage on their breathing machine, right? It's ice is up, 
you're never going to get that in the real world, right? And they go into some more details about this work. And then, then basically the, the Navy was able to issue a certificate saying that this is, that's regulator is, um, is allowed to be used by the Navy for operations, you know, under the, uh, under the ice, et cetera. Right. So I thought that'd be pretty, uh, cool to, uh, to share. So, um, do you want to take a couple of questions down now? Are you back at your, yeah. Okay. Here, so yes, I can. So Just here's a couple of things. So, so uh, Jammer had asked about the filter media on the second stage. Just the filter media on the second stage. What was his question? What, uh, let's see, uh, it says, what's the filter media second stage reg? So want to unmute yourself, maybe Jammer? I can throw it to you. Uh, first or second, right? There's oh, a, first, okay. There's some type of filter, so what is it? Oh, the conical filter on the first stage. Okay. I, I, I think I have exactly what you're talking about. Yes. Do I, I can't. Do you, can you see me? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm trying to find the little camera. This is what you're talking about, this little filter here. Yeah, it's just taking, like, large particles. It's not like a HEPA or anything, right? It, it, it's, I don't know how many microns it goes down to. It's actually crushed aluminum is how it, they, they designed it. They told me it's a molded crushed aluminum when I was sure. in the class, taking the class. Everybody uses pretty much the same. I mean, they come in different, different styles. Some regulators take the cones, um, some take the hats. Yeah, but that, they're all pretty much made out of that same material. It doesn't matter if it's Scuba Pro, Oceanic. They're all using that. It's like a really fine crushed aluminum molded back together. Oh, all right, thanks. Yeah. Um, they do, I mean, they collect the salt really well. I wish I had one here that was corroded. I've taken the garbage out and everything's gone. <laughs> right. um, all right, other, other questions uh, we have. Um, so uh, every time we get a reg service, do you take out and replace all the things we just saw, aside you know, from the BCD? No. So, Actually, let me, uh, let me move yeah. a few things and I will pull out a replacement kit and show you what's so you certainly inspect everything, everything and then gets, there's, there's, according to manufacturer specifications, and they all differ by manufacturer and the reg, there's different parts that are required to be inspected and are different parts that are required to be replaced so, based on which surface interval. All right. So I this think Don is, is finding a kit. kit. Right out of the, right out of the thing. It's for, <laughs> well, yep. Could you see that? Where here, here's one of those things I was talking about. A standard Mare's kit runs twelve or thirteen dollars. A standard Scuba Pro kit is forty eight dollars. <laughs> so those kind, of, when you're looking at a regulator to purchase, are probably some of the more important. You know, you want to have this done yearly. So this is what's involved with this kit. Your new filter. Can you guys see this? Am I showing good pictures? Put a little higher. A little there higher. you go. Perfect. Yep, you got it. You get the new filter, new retaining clip. This one's a Viacon kit, so this one's good for nitrox and stuff like that. So that's why all these O-rings are brown, not black. And what it is is all of the O-rings throughout the whole kit. Now somebody's going to ask me, why is one of them green? The one that is green is for the hose going to the first stage. The rest of them are all brown, but they're all, this, if it was not for a nitrox rag, it would be all black, regular silicone O-rings. So we would, we would replace all the O-rings and then from there, everything else would be inspected. Um, usually poppets and seats every couple years, I would replace those. Um, Diaphragm, look at it. I mean, and if it needed to be replaced, we'd replace that. If somebody was having an issue with breathing or something like that, may look at everything a little deeper and see why we're having breathing issues and stuff. Get it back on the flow bench and reflow it. Right. Um, so a uh, couple of questions came in on the same topic. How often do you need to service your regulator BC? Oh, so, perfect. Yeah. This, this is probably, everybody's going to look at me and say, what? I think that if you're, if you're just diving fresh water every two years, you should at least have it opened up, inspected, cleaned, put back together. 
if you go on a trip, as soon as you get back from the trip, the quicker you can get the regulator out of the salt water and here cleaned, put back together, it will last a lot longer. It's the person that, hey, I went on the trip to the Philippines and yeah, I'm not really, I'm a little, you know, it was an expensive trip in the sand. And then they leave it in their case and they leave it until, hey, I'm going diving again. I probably should get my thing. And it's, that's when all the corrosion happens. So the quicker you get back from a vacation is when you want to do it. You want to have those, you want to have everything cleaned really well. Uh, related to that, uh, I have an atomic uh, titanium reg with a three-year, 300-dive service interval. Do you agree with that for safety? So Jim's going to ask the and do the lawyer question first. It's like we have to follow what the manufacturers, you know, say. But Personally, I don't agree with it. I, but. I think that you still want to have it opened up, clean, make sure that you know you. It, all it takes is the smallest. I mean. You saw those regulators that we were looking at in the pictures there. All it takes is the smallest amount of salt to get in there and start corroding it. Yeah, it might be good, but on that 300th dive, you're in the Caribbean or something like that. And then all of a sudden, are you going to stop and go get it serviced? No, you probably want to have it. Just, I don't know. I, I, personally, I would service it after every time I go in salt water. I do it with mine and my wife's regs. I do it with Jim's regs. Most of the guys in the shop and girls in the shop team. I do it with their records too. Okay. Sorry, folks. I, I just forgot that I was sharing there. So there's Don again. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So so my my thought on that is very similar, right? So so manufacturers have a uh, a record recommended limit uh, for a reason. Um, I think part of that reason is marketing, right? Um, but in a 300 dive service, you're going to breathe a lot of times in 300 dives. So remember, these are dynamic O-ring. Things are moving across the O-ring wearing it down, right? So you get a little teeny piece of sand there. You take a nick out of something. It's going to start free flowing a little bit. It's going to be a wear point, et cetera, right? So, you know, Mari's is saying now theirs across the board is two years. Um, the average number of dives per diver, right, believe it or not, is eight dives a year, right? So what does two years mean? Does two years mean 16 dives? No, right? This is use common part. sense. If you're in Florida, that could be a lot more. Right, right. Um, okay, uh, so what's the burst pressure of a burst disc? Well, that is, oh, sorry, sorry, Dave, was that supposed to be a question to, the, to everyone else or is that a question? A yeah, question, I, question. I, I didn't know the answer to that. We talked about the burst disc, but you know, when, when does it blow? It depends is the answer. Can you I, read this one? Can you guys see that? Bring it out a little bit. There you go. So this here is a 3442 burst disc. Probably is not blowing off at 3500. Um, you can purchase these in different waves and then you have the old time Caribbean guys who will stack burst discs. <laughs> stack them? Um, yeah, so you would instead of, see that there's a little copper piece here on the back side. This little copper piece, what they'll do is they'll stack those. Um, and you don't want it to, I wouldn't, if I took it apart and I saw that I'd unstack it just because it's not safe. Um, right. But that's like people ask us, like, what's a good dive shop where I'm going, right? And the good dive shop, there's, there's things that go into that question, right? So safety has to be number one, right? So how are tank fills done? Are they, they have, they not have enough tanks to support, um, you know, letting tanks fill at a uh, reasonable rate? Or are they taking the, the tanks off the morning boat and throwing in their air in there as fast as they can? If so, in the hot Caribbean environment, those tanks are gonna get really hot. So what Don was talking about is the standards for the tank may be that it's a 3000 uh, PSI working pressure, but the tank can actually handle more pressure than that with, before it ruptures, right? But it's designed with a certain burst pressure right? So people who override that, they're taking safety, you know, your safety, because you have that hot thing strapped onto your back, right? So one of the things that we always look at is like how people are doing, we, we were looking at uh, various places where we take divers, we check out the repair rooms. Is it dirty, greasy, nasty? What are they doing, right? How are they hanging the tanks? Are they throwing their tanks around? 
you know, or are they, are they treating them like a high pressure, you know, uh, potential bomb like they are, right? <laughs> so things like that. So, so it I depends on a, the initial uh, pressure of the tank. Um, and uh, uh, usually it's a, is aluminum, aluminum 3000, 34, 42, which, which probably will burst at 36. Yeah, I, that, that, that burst disc is probably going to go between 36 and 3,800 PSI. Um, the problem is, is that do you want to be halfway up to the Thousand Islands getting ready for a great weekend and, you know, it goes off in the trunk of your car besides scaring the living daylights out of you? <laughs> no, it's not worth a, a couple extra pounds of air. It's, it, that, that's what people, everybody's like, oh, get as much in there as you possibly can. It's, it's, you're talking a matter of minutes or seconds under the water. Um, you need a pony bottle. You need, you know, a bigger cylinder. Um, yeah, I, I think people like, yeah, they, they get all excited. Ooh, this tank has 3,100. Ooh, I got a great fill. <laughs> and, and we were all there. I, I don't know how, I mean, Jimmy was with me. I bought a, I needed this big, huge 100 cubic foot yeah. tank when, when diving, started diving more around home because the water's so cold and I was going through air. It's, once you get more calm, more time in the water, you're less apt to have used that much air. You start to dive more to your nitrogen levels and stuff like that. Um, it's, it, it, that's probably one of the more important things is dive to your level, you know, call, call a dive when you're done and you're down to, you know, 700 PSI, you, you call the dive, you can, nothing says you can, air is pretty cheap, you can go back in another cylinder full of air and go right back out. It's, that kind of thing is really important. At least you got up and safely did it, all that. But the cleanliness of the shop, I mean, we, I, this room here, everybody's like, well, why do you work in such a small room? It's less I have to clean before I bring your life support equipment in and work mm -hmm. on it. And then it gets tested out and stuff like that. Um, can I miss something? Yeah, I definitely can miss stuff, but I try really hard not to. I try to keep everything super clean. Um, when I'm doing stuff like that, the, show, the door will get shut. Um, it's really important to me. I really look at it as I'm not just servicing a customer's thing. I'm servicing my friend's equipment my wife's equipment, my own equipment, things like that. I think everybody's the same. It doesn't matter whose name's on the bag. And, and you, you no longer lick all the parts. That's the, that's the new thing. Well, some of them. I you know, do. you know, so, um, <laughs> yeah. okay. Hey, hey uh, Bill, I'm opening up your Navy rag. I want to show people that cold water part. So <laughs> and we're all jealous of that rag. Yeah, there you go. So this is, this is this cold water rag. Oh, wait, hold right. on a second, so, um, oh, so if you, Hey, Dave, how do I, how can you pin me? Yes, I can. Hang okay. On. There you go. There we go. All right. So that bad boy right there looks for, from here, looks familiar. That's the, the sealed part. So you see now there's a diaphragm here. So water is not going to get into this part, right? That helps out a bit. And then there's just, it looks very similar, I think, to that other rag. And just, underneath that diaphragm, Jim, is oil. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yes. And oil filled regulator. So when, when I take those apart, there's things in, in scuba that just don't go together. And that's oil and air and stuff like that. Funny taste. Um, most of the stuff coming from our shop is green to taste lemony. I use a lot of um, simple green lemon. So you will end up, usually people that come back say, wow, I had a little lemony taste to it. Um, but that regulator actually has really real oil in it. And that's kind of a messy job. I like doing those because <laughs> you have to rip the air out of it all right um so don mentioned this um uh earlier and some people talked about last week full face mask right so while this may be a different piece of equipment than people are used to right what is it it's a mask with a regulator right this regulator designs the same right it's just you notice that in this part right here Remember that, that valve that when you breathe into the diaphragm, it moves a lever back, the lever opens up a valve. The valve's in here, the diaphragm's over here. It's just offset. Instead of being together in a hub, it's just offset a little bit, right? Um, we, there's one-way valves, so you can exhale hail air out. You can, can see that in there, probably not too well. Um, and it's really, ju it's just a little different way to do things, right? Um, so... In addition to that, I, uh, some people asked about different style BCs. Hopefully I can reach without killing myself. Um, one of the things that we asked, uh, people asked about last time 
was um, different styles of BC, right? So most people's BC tend to be very jacket-like, right? So you put it on, the tank's attached to the back, et cetera. And the way the industry is moving, right? We had these, uh, these uh, more technical BCs, I'm putting air quotes around that. So technical divers, tend to wear multiple tanks on their back, maybe some on their sides, et cetera. So they need a lot of attachment points. So rather than using a BC that wraps around them like a jacket, they start with this back plate, right? So technical divers will probably have a, a steel back plate. Can you hold it up um, a little and, higher? Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. Thank you. Yep, thanks. Um, so they, they start with this steel back plate and then this back part, which is called the wing, that would hold the tank, right? You could get a single one like this one, but most of them would have it a little different design so you could put multiple tanks in the back, right? Well, that's, uh, there's some advantages with that, um, especially uh, if you're a traveling diver. If you notice, this thing is tiny, right? So this is um, aluminum and Jammer's asking if this is his BC and yes, sir, it would be. Um, so I can give you a great deal on a Navy reg right now too, because Bill has to drive two hours to get it in case you care. <laughs> um, so if you notice it's very small, right? And so it's very lightweight as well. So recreational divers are starting to use these because when you're wearing it, it's like you're not wearing anything at all. Everything's, um, behind you is not in front and it's much, much smaller, right? So there's a trade-off there. Right, so there's a trade-off that you don't have pockets, right? So rather than having pockets, put a flashlight, et cetera, what you do is you would clip in uh, those things. It's just a, a little different way of doing things. And uh, when we went to, uh, down to the Philippines, we saw that um, a very, very um, large number of the dive professionals have switched over. And we saw a lot of these um, in recreational divers as well. So we're doing a little more with, with this style nowadays. Um, so, so Don, I think you're probably the, the one that most recently kind of made the switch. I over, yeah, I switched over just after the Philippines trip. In the first week or two, I was like, oh, I don't know about this. Now you couldn't take it away from me. <laughs> it's, as, it's as valuable to me now as my CPAP machine for sleeping at night. <laughs> I really, it's comfortable. There's nothing hardly around you. Um, I found different ways to wait. When I go on vacation, it's a lot less weight that I'm putting on things like that. It's, it's very, very, I like it a lot. Right. And so one of the things that you did is different. So this is a lightweight one, right? Um, so the one that you had ordered was that, that stainless steel one, right? Yeah. So the BC itself is negatively buoyant, right? So didn't you, didn't you strip off, was it six pounds of lead uh, yeah. from your weights? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Sorry, I dropped something. <laughs> So you, when you're diving in fresh water with it, you know, in a five mil suit without hooded gloves, what do you need? Two pounds of lead? <laughs> I, yeah, right now I think I'm using uh, just, I think four, four to six, depending on okay. I mean, the hood and gloves. Yeah, four to six pounds. Um, dry suit, the other day I ended up with, I think it was, oh gosh, 12 pounds, 12, 13 more pounds, something like that. Um, didn't have really heavy clothes on, but... It's just nice, and it, and all that weight is is spread really nice along your back, so that that worked out good. Um, I was going to show this too, Jim. We okay, we, take it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no. The shop that we use when we travel and stuff like that, and what it does is it goes onto the BCD oh. inflator like so, and it hooks up to a garden hose, and this way you can wash out all those mm -hmm. parts, all the parts in your BCD inflator. I think that's, it really works out good. All right. Um, so so Tom, where, do you, where do you get something like that? Oh. Oh, the gift shop. Because <laughs> I, I want one. <laughs> well, it requires advanced training, Dave. There's a whole class. Okay. Load, right? Yeah. You know, you know right, sign me advanced up. guarding hold usage. Yeah. You know, that, so. that's the, you're spending a good amount of money in, in and really, over the years, the one thing that Jim and I both agree on, it's, a, it's an expensive sport. And we see a lot of our, our friends, being all of you that are watching this right now, um, we don't want to run into somebody in a restaurant or someplace out in town and say, hey, I haven't used all this gear in forever, and what's it worth? And you have to look at it and say, oh, like 50 cents on a dollar. You know, we really want to do something where 
people make smart decisions when purchasing something, they realize what they're getting into and things like that and how to service it and keep it good for the future. So that it lasts, yeah. it's, it lasts a long time. The cheapest way to buy something is to buy it once. Correct. Right. So a couple of questions came in. So what's the best environment to keep our tanks? Indoor or garage? Does it change in the winter? No, indoor garage is perfect. Not next to the furnace or the, or the wood burning stove in the basement. Yeah. Cool right. and dry, stuff like that. Always right. keep it, it's, that's important. You wanna keep at least, you know, five, 600 PSI of air in them. You don't wanna store them empty. You wanna store them full or, or with a little bit of air in them. And the air doesn't go bad. If you, I mean, if you have it three or four years, you might wanna bring it in, have us, you're gonna to have to have it visited anyway. And at that point, we'll drop all the air out and put it new fresh air in. But if it's now, a, two, in, yeah. in the first week of September, we switched to uh, pumpkin air. Right, isn't that right with a yeah, we do pumpkin air and then we're in lemon air right now, aren't we? Yeah, but they're talking eight inches of snow this weekend. Oh, That's back to pumpkin air it is then, okay. Pumpkin, yeah, pumpkin cream air, whatever. Pumpkin cream ale, that doesn't sound right. Anyway. Um, all right. Uh, what does it call for a basic inspection, not including major problems with the equipment? Pumpkin spice air, that's good. There's PSA, pumpkin spice air, yeah. So. Um what do we have on the wall, Jim? <laughs> 35 bucks a stage plus parts as yes. needed. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right. And, you, and usually figure that your regulator is going to be out of service for you for two, maybe three weeks, depending on what's on the board getting done. Right. Uh, so, Don, question for you from Pat. Are you getting an aluminum plate for travel or are you going to travel with the steel? Steel. Not moving it. Once your straps are set, <laughs> you, don't want it, you want it set for you. I mean... Jim wanted to borrow mine, and I'm like, you can't move the straps. Right. <laughs> so, well, so our thought originally when, when we, we ordered that, that BC was like, hey, you know what? We have all these different sizes of BCs in rental. So I think we have 17 regs in our rental department. I don't know, 24, 25 BCs, something like that. Right. I can count on, on one hand the number of times we needed the extra, extra, extra small. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so um, we thought, hey, with these, it's one size fit all for – for this style BC, right? It's one size fit all because these straps, you know, you set the straps and inside, oh, I, uh, can you pin me again, Dave? Oh yeah, hang on. All right. Dave worked for his money tonight. Yeah, exactly. Um, I guess we should have rehearsed this part, huh? Um, <laughs> anyway, so right down here where you adjust the strap, there's a little thing you can put in here that makes a slide. Right, and what it does is it, it loosens this one side. So we said, "Hey, this is great. We can go down to like 17 BCs, and we can fit everybody size with just one of these." Well, the problem is, is that you really get it set to you, right? And so while this can slide back and forth, the other side doesn't, right? And uh, so it's really once you get it set, you really don't want to mess around with it too much. Um, cost. Oh, the other thing I should mention with with this style. Um, I don't know if you can see, but that is one nice piece of metal, and I wish you could feel this because it's much, much thicker nylon. And uh, and the inside here, there's a zipper. I'm going to try to open up to give you a better idea. I think that a lot of the the, the instructors and the profession, dive professional group of people that we've seen using these, I think that a lot of people have gone to this style of BCB is because the straps are heavier. The bladder is heavier. The whole thing is, it's, it's made just a little bit better than a off the rack BCD. Right. And you, if you notice here, I opened this up inside the part where the air will go in the back. On a standard BCD, it's normally a, an airproof material that is the seams are glued and then they're stitched and they normally there's an over stitch over that. Right. But it can wear down through time and it can certainly get punctured. Right. When the BC gets punctured or wears down, it's reached its end of life, right? There's some goo you can put on it, but that's just denying the, uh, delaying the inevitable, right? With this, if you notice, there is a, a bladder on the inside of this, right? You can replace the bladder, right? So the material is very thick, right? So odds are it's not going to get little pinpricks on it, but when the bladder itself reaches the end of its life, right, you change up a $50 part, rather than having to, uh, to redo a BC, right? So uh, costs on these initial costs are a little bit more, but there's actually much more to these. So you know, you're looking at probably uh, this one, I think is a, a 
450 ish range. Um, maybe I'm maybe 500, something like that. And so there's a little bit of a premium uh, over a, a similarly styled, um, more travel BC, but it's right in the same ballpark of, of any kind of more heavy duty BC. Right. Couple more questions. There's the cost, pumpkin spice air. Um, can you do a quick release clip instead of the DIR style? Uh, you mean on the, up on the shoulders, Brian? Yeah, yeah. So you can change it so that it, it's you can change all the straps uh, for length and customize it per person. So you could, but remember that's going to be a weight bearing area, right? Yeah. So in in more technical style BCs, they tend to be very flat here because you don't have the cushion around you. So that's going to be hitting on your shoulder. Well, I was thinking for your your rentals. Oh yeah, for rentals, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but you, you know, when you start doing rentals, then you have to worry about liability. And now we are oh, okay. changing the manufacturer's gear. So, God forbid something happens, they're going to point the fingers to us. Why did you change the manufacturer's gear? Uh, do you have a degree in BC design? No, no. Nope. Um, the other thing I want to mention too is I'm looking a little bit in the future here. This thing right here. This is your new wetsuit, right? So I, I tried one of these down in Stacia. What it is, is it's, it's super hard to see again, but it's just a very tight uh, fleece, right? I had a one piece suit. I've learned that's a mistake, right? The, the dive professionals uh, are now are going this way uh, with two piece suits. So this is as warm as a three mil suit, right? So what I have is a top piece, Right, and then I have pants. Right, I just have pants. Right, if I need to be a little warmer, I can wear the little under vest as well. Right, and I fell in love with that style uh, when I went down in station in February. Um, so I think this is what's going to be taking over the industry as well. So rather than having this this uh, big wetsuit that takes a long time to dry, all of that. These things dry very, very quickly. I know like, I think was it Pat, you also had one. Is that correct? If you're still around. Yeah, Pat's there, hang on, Pat. Oh, Pat's off, you sorry. Yeah, yeah, I have the, uh, oh, the um, shark skin. Yeah, it's, you know, but it's- I it's. Also have, I also have lava core pants um, and I also have shark skin pants, but I like the lava core because they don't have the stirrups. Right. I also right. have a full piece lava core that I don't wear because like you were having trouble, it got too big. Yeah. So I don't wear that anymore because it, it gets too baggy on me. Yeah, what I've noticed that these, uh, these uh, materials are very tight initially and about the third dive, they loosen up. So um, like the, I, I should be a large and I think I was wearing an extra large and it was where like, I, I feel like I had a full diaper on when I was wearing the one piece suit right. after the third or fourth dive. Um, but uh, it was it combined the the very thin amount of material on you with a, a, a technical style back inflate BC, and it's going to be like you're diving with nothing on. And it's a very freeing experience. So you don't have that struggling to get in and out of a wetsuit. So, um, and I love the fact that they were, they were almost 100% dry over lunch. And you can put them in the wash. The and machine. you can too. Yes. Yeah, I don't know what it is. So whenever I have my wetsuit, somebody pees in it. I don't know who it is. It's just somebody pees in it. And uh, yeah, you can wash these. I don't know why someone would sneak in the middle of the night and pee in my wetsuit. They do. So, yeah. Oh, is that too much? Oh, okay. Perhaps I know that they do. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, oh, uh, then there was a question about a save a dive kit. I missed that. Um, so what would you recommend in a save a dive kit? Um, first of all, zip ties are your friend. Uh, yep. Mouthpiece, fin strap, mass strap, um, some tank O-rings. Um, if you really want to go crazy, a, um, a repair kit for your reg just in case. Uh, what am I forgetting? Spare mask would be making a, a nice little kit as well. Yeah, because even if you're going on vacation and you have, and you purchase the the spare O-ring kit for your regulator. You might not be the tech to do it, but if you're going to a Grand Cayman, a Bonaire, a Philippines, wherever you're going in the world, 
there's going to be a dive shop there that's going to have a repair tech that would be able to put your kid in. So it probably isn't a bad idea to, to have one kid. Clearly. Right. Strap, fin straps. Yeah. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, maybe a little tool. There's, there's a little, oh, good timing, Chelsea. There's a, there's a little tool. It's like a save a dive tool um, that has all the, the tools you would need. If you're going someplace incredibly remote, right? And we're talking like, um, you know, not someplace like Indonesia, which is, you know, remote as compared to, you know, to, to us, it's far away, but you're going to dive resorts. If you're going to, um, well, I don't know, the South Pacific in an island that they normally wouldn't dive, you're going to um, um, you know, Vanuatu, you're going to uh, Guadalcanal, someplace like that, you're on a liveaboard, right? And, um, that you have your gear, it's maybe not a bad idea to bring a complete separate set of regulators. Batteries for your computer, if you can change your own batteries. That's always a good one. Um, a spare charger or a spare charging cable if it's, if it's a rechargeable battery, right? Um, you may want to have your, you know, make sure your battery is, is uh, fully charged, holds a full charge before you go. Even with the amount of diving that, that we do and the amount of trips that we go on, I find it really helpful, and I'm not really a list person, but I'll tell you, I write a list and I have a checkoff list before I leave to go someplace, and I find it to be very, very helpful. Um, you, you know, you start at your feet, you say fins, boots, you know, work your way right up through your body and stuff like that. Nothing worse than getting to the water and, oh, I forgot my fins, or oh, where's my computer? Oh, wow. I brought my camera, but I didn't put an SD card in it. And, and trust me, all that stuff has happened. Rusty and I were, were going for a dive in Bonaire. We were down there last Easter. And I, we had a beautiful house we rented, had wash tanks out there for all of our gear and stuff. And didn't I uh, leave my regulator in the wash tank? And we got to the dive site. We're ready to go. We're all suited up. And I'm like, hey, did you see my reg? Where's my reg? Hey, I don't know where it is. And then I thought, well, I put it on top of the car. I know I had it. Well, now we're looking, driving halfway across the island, looking for this regulator that I wore was there. And I'm ready to just go purchase another one or steal my wife's because hoping she wasn't going to go diving. And I look in the tank or Rusty looked in the tank and, hey, here it is. That feeling of, oh, it's, it's, not, it's not cheap. It's got my transducer on it for my computer. It has... You know, everything is right there. So to have that list and to even on your daily before you go out, it's a great idea to check that list. So uh, I ran downstairs. So Dave, can you repin me? Yep. So this is one of those old scuba tools, right? So you have a screwdriver, you have a hex, you got a couple different wrench sizes, you have a pick, you have a flat blade. You have a Phillips head, a couple different size hex. That's that. And then for the Save a Dive Kit, let's see what innovative scuba concepts is in what's in theirs. They have one universal fin strap, one universal mass strap, two replacement tank O-rings, one snorkel keeper, one mouthpiece, and two cable die ties. So not a bad start. I would say maybe the uh, snorkel keeper is probably the only thing that's a little questionable. Um, whether you need one or not. And uh, so then the other thing, other question we had was, um, uh, Don, when you were going, someone saw the uh, spear gun in the, the back of, uh, of the, uh, <laughs> right? And so they said, hey, nice spear gun. It's like too bad New York State won't let us um, have those. But there's a tool you can use in New York. So in freshwater New York, in New York, because of the low visibility we have, spear gun use is illegal right and so think about it you're swimming along you see something murky 20 30 feet away right you shoot at it and you find it's your buddy right so um even if you're snorkeling not on scuba right they have problems with it so what you can you, you can't use a hawaiian sling either hawaiian sling is you bring back a, a sling instead of a gun right um it still releases a projectile so meet the elf right so what this is, is a, it's connected to you. So you pull this back and you shoot it. It was designed for people hunting lionfish. Now in this configuration, it doesn't look too exciting, 
that when you screw that bad boy on it, it becomes pretty lethal to fish. <laughs> right? And so my understanding is that because this will never leave your hand, it is allowed in fresh waters. Right? So um, if you want to go out hunting, all right, there you go. I still believe you cannot hunt on scuba in uh, New York state waters, but you could at least free dive, right? With that said, gobies are an invasive species. And so I think it's our moral obligation to kill them all. <laughs> and with that said, we cannot use those in the quarry. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. So, um, yeah, so that I, I picked this up uh, over the winter. So we are going to uh, try it out on, uh, uh, on some gobies come uh, welcome whenever we can get in the water. So. All right. So Gene says you cannot have a spear gun in the Adirondacks at all, right? That is not a spear gun. <laughs> so we are lawyering New York State rules. So Gene, here's the deal. I'll let you borrow it. And if you still have a boat in a camp come fall, we know that it, it works. All right. Sounds good. I think there I'll you go. go for that. And then, Gene, yeah, you no, had a suggestion but, for somebody as well. Yeah, uh, about the spear gun. I mean, if you have one, even an antique, and you put it over the mantelpiece where it's obviously screwed to the wall, that is still illegal. And the uh, DEC law enforcement guys up there are really bored and said they'd love to find something like that and find you. So uh, the suggestion about the roll-off snorkel. Yep, go right ahead. It's just a cool thing to have in your BC. It looks kind of weird, but if you are out of air, lost your snorkel, dog tired in the fair chop, that is a wonderful thing to be able to just pull out, unwrap, stuff in your mouth and be able to swim uh you know back to the boat or wherever uh it just doesn't take up hardly any room to, it works and are you for scuba happens to have a few of them the other thing is is when you get your little dive wrench or well, any tool set you have you may want to test make sure it fits the stuff that you have there are different sizes of everything uh, you know, most of it's all metric, and sometimes those tool sets are, you know, fashioned by some Yankee, and so they don't have things that fit. So I would always take the, the stuff apart, make sure you know what's in it so it's there, and how to use it. Make sure it does work. Right. So that you. is your, your little roll-up snorkel. And it fits in a little, it fits in a little plastic thing. It just goes right in your pocket, and Yep, just wonderful. Yeah, this particular style is a little kit for, uh, it's a backup mask as well. And so this would be designed like if you have um, on the, uh, the wing BC, you would fit it around the strap, probably have it down at your hip here. So it comes with a, a spare mask and snorkel, a little kit. So uh, it was designed by the people who, uh, who actually make the uh, full face masks that when you have a full face mask, one of the things you have to do is carry a spare mask with you. In case there's flooding uh, in your mask, you still have to be able to see to bail out of the dive. So you have to carry a spare mask. So they came up with this little clever system of a, of a mask and the roll of snorkel that fits in this little kit. And it's a very comfortable mask. It's actually, yeah, I actually, I kind of wish the mask was independent. So. Hey, uh, Jim, I want to mention one more thing about the wing. Uh, an option, which is pretty handy, is the uh, tech shorts. Um, I, I got from you guys. Yep. That was a good alternative to the um, having all the, uh, you know, strap. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what, uh, what Joe's talking about is um, uh, instructors uh, have to um, have to carry like a billion and one things with us, right? So we have to make sure we have abilities, you know, gears to rescue people and to signal people in case loss and all that. We have our slates uh, just to make sure that we don't skip any steps during instruction, et cetera. We normally hang those all off ourselves. Um, but when you're nice and clean and you have a back style BC, you don't necessarily want 9 million things hanging off of you. So uh, if you're wearing a dry suit, you normally have pockets sewn in the suits where you put things. But if you're in a wet suit, um, what Joe was talking about, there's actually shorts that you wear that you leave all your junk in there, 
right? And then you just slip the shorts on over your wetsuit. And what's great about them is if you're in really warm water, you don't wear a wetsuit, you still wear your shorts, right? So it's not like um, you have to um, still have just all this stuff around you. So a uh, couple of questions about full face mask. I should have just done this from downstairs. I'm pulling so many things off the wall. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So how do you equalize in this thing, right? So you think about it, you pinch your nose, you blow. It's hard to pinch, right? So inside of here, it's going to be, I think, tough to see. But see this little V thing right there, right? That gets fitted just below the opening of your nostrils. And then when you push in and up, it blocks it, and it functions just the same of, of pinching your ear. Also, if you think about different techniques you can use, you can also wiggle your jaw from side to side and swallow. And uh, that maneuver can also be used to, uh, to equalize. Uh, but usually what happens, you just use this little block right here, you get it set for you, right? And then you just push in and up and it brings that little bit, which you probably can't see because it's black on black. Oh, we can see it. Okay, to your nose, right? And then other things you can add, you can add communication systems to this and all that. Uh, that's why a lot of the, uh, uh, the police organizations uh, use full face masks. Um, you also cover more of your face. So if you are a very cold water diver, it's warmer, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, you're going diving in chilly, chilly water, you're probably in a dry suit. You're probably gonna have dry gloves on your hands, right? Mm -hmm. So the only part of you uh, that will uh, have neoprene that'll get wet is, um, is your hood. And you get a, a, a spoke dry suit hood um, and you can get them so this lip around the, your face mask fits between a lip on the hood. So um, you really don't get a lot of water on you at all. All right, let's see. I think that may be it for the questions. Is that it? All right, do you wanna, Dave, do you wanna do open up uh, to everyone to talk or? Yes. There you go. Are we in the after, we just segue into the after party 20 minutes ago? <laughs> Hang on one second. Oh, there you go. So here we are, workshop four. That was really impressive. And I wanted to thank Don and Don and Jim for, um, I think doing it in that way was, was way more interesting than, than going through, you know, PowerPoint by death. <clears throat> and thank you for your help, Dave. I sure we don't want to do some of the math from the first day. <laughs> we can go back. Oh, I think we should do tables. There you go. Bill's got it. Our split fins too. <laughs> but I think we should thank everybody that's been here with us over the past two weeks because um, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun getting together with people that care about diving, think about diving, wish we were diving, um, and we will be soon. <clears throat> um, but this is the end of the uh, Science of Diving workshops. So, you know, Work on finishing off that science of diving specialty so you can get that under your belt. Think about those other specialties that Jim talked to you about, and maybe even some of those recognitions of specialty diver, advanced open water diver, master diver, and um, <clears throat> you know, we can we can still be productive when we can't be in the water. Um, and the picture I have on the right hand side there is the uh, the, the new the new instructor crew from last summer. So. Um, a lot of them were presenting to you over the past two weeks. And, um, you know, I think the Are You For Scuba family is a great one. And um, I'm, I'm happy to be with these guys. So the, the email address at the bottom down there dives at areyouforscuba.com. If you have any feedback for us on these workshops or you have ideas for future workshops, I know Jim, we were talking about doing maybe something weekly or bi-weekly where we can just like hit on a cool topic. Um, <clears throat> so we certainly want to get your feedback and, you know, keep your ear to the um, track and we'll, we'll send right. out the plans for the next couple. Yeah. Of and, and I'll try to get the, uh, the NOAA diver. Um, so 
Uh, and then I also just, as you know, I, um, I, I attended a, uh, a webinar yesterday uh, with, uh, from Wood Holes Oceanographic Institute, where Bob Ballard, uh, the discovery, discoverer of the Titanic, um, and uh, about, oh, 200 other wrecks, including ones right in Lake Ontario, the Hamilton and the Scourge, uh, the, uh, he uh, got together with some research scientists and they talked uh, about um, how or why wrecks are important uh, it, to science, right? So we know the historical aspect of them. Uh, but uh, what I was uh, hoping to do is to get a, uh, a presentation like that put together. I don't think we're going to get Bob Ballard. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I was, uh, reached out to the researcher and asked if she, you know, she wouldn't mind doing that. Um, I found it fascinating. He was talking about uh, the reason wrecks are important is because it's a known date when something entered the bottom and they can measure um, from that date forward how something else compared. So that's pretty, pretty cool. And then uh, they also have a great series uh, that you can sign up for uh, as well. They're really, uh, really interested. I think it was, uh, was, it, was it Greg? I think you sent that out uh, the other day, didn't you? Um, the, the Woods Hole thing. I think you sent it out. It was, it was really interesting. Thanks for doing that. I think it was Greg, at least. <laughs> okay, with that, how about we unmute everybody? Uh, since I can figure out that. Hang on. Unmute all. There we go. All right, so the, the floor is open. If you have questions, uh, sh shoot them out. Are you doing servicing on gear now? If we were to yes. drop it off? Yes, we yeah. are. How would I make arrangements for that? You can give me a call at the shop. I will figure okay. something out. Yep. Sounds good. Are you, you're, yeah, I'll, I'll make something work with you, Pat. Pat's Canadagua. There's, yep. there are, there's this thing called the post office, you know. Uh, we'll figure it out. <laughs> it cost a fortune to mail it there. <laughs> No, I was. I mean, I've got that titanium rig, but I might as well. It's been in salt water only, so yeah. um, I might as well get that done. I'm not diving because I'm supposed to be in Little Cayman right now. So <laughs> same. It's going to snow tonight. Same difference. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so I might weird. as well get the stuff serviced. All right, be ready for when the weather is beautiful. Yeah, exactly. I don't think it'll ever get Little Cayman beautiful here, though. Probably not. I'm so bummed. It would be too. <laughs> and we were celebrating this gentleman's 90th birthday. And that's what we were supposed to be doing down there. We, oh, we all bunch, Yeah, and he's, this was going to be his last diving trip. Oh. So it's kind of a bummer. Oh. Well, tell them to hang on there and do it next year. Yeah, I can't go. They are going next year. Kelly's going, but I already have something planned, so I can't go. Oh, well. I'll see you again, Pat. That's okay. I'll go again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You'll be able to zoom pictures and share. Yeah. I mean, if you like the Cayman kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. yeah. I, I like that resort Anywhere kind of diving warm. <laughs> have you ever dove with the reef divers? On Little... Um, well, they they have a resort on Little Brock and uh, Grand. Who did we dive with at, at Brock? Cayman Brock, Jim. Cayman Brock was. Let me remind. Uh, rem, okay, so dive sites kind of merged together after after a while. So I'm trying to think. Brock was the one that was like two resorts next to each other, and there was like nothing to do, right? Yes. Well, that's one. the whole island of Brock. There's nothing. Yeah, there. yeah. Okay, I'm just trying to get those right. Um, I see the logo. It had a dive flag on it. <laughs> Shocker. Um, you know, I could go to the Googles and find out. But. They do valet diving, if that helps yeah. any. Well. That's what I liked about my it. My spoiled butt only does valet diving as well. Yeah, so maybe it. They do, they do a nice, they do a nice, uh, they have good food. It's all inclusive. They do a pretty good job. I, I, I like them. Maybe I don't remember all-inclusive. Yeah, it's all-inclusive. All right. 
talking about valet diving, maybe you should run through what valet diving is. It's the best. Right. <laughs> so are you talking to me or talking to Pat? Oh, you want me to do it or Jim? I figured one of you would like to explain what Oh, well, so valet diving, basically, they take care of everything. So the night, the, the night before you start diving, you put your gear out in a little bag outside your door. They come pick it up. And then you don't have to touch it again other than your wetsuit and your cameras. They, they'll take care of everything. And if you want to take care of your reg and your stuff, that yourself, you still can. But they'll do it. And then you get on the boat and it's all set up for you already. And what I liked about their boats was that um, you walked to the end of the dock or to the end of the boat with your uh, mask and fins in your hand. And they had seats that they built out of stainless steel and you sat on the seats. Then they put your gear on you and then you stood up and went in the water. So you didn't, you weren't traipsing across the boat with your fins on. It makes it a lot nicer. Well, my bar is a little higher. I normally like would jump in the water and they have a trained octopus then would put all the gear on me in the water. You know, well, so. It just, it just seems to make a lot of sense to yeah. me because when you're walking on the boat, you know, yourself, people's fins are sticking out. You're walking over them. It's a lot of trip hazards. I just like that the way they do that where you walk with your, you know, your mask and your uh, camera if you have it or if you're going to have them handed or and you know your hand your fins in your hands you sit down you put your fins on and then they put your gear on your back for you now the reason that i asked that question was for somebody to explain it captain rusty's standing next to me here um social distancing at its finest and i needed him to understand what his you know at the boat captain in lake ontario will be in the years to come it is um, over. I'm expecting that maybe now he knows what he needs to do. Now, with that said, Pat, you probably also do a little tipping. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. Captain. Now, what we established crip tipping is for the crew only, not the captain. That's right. <laughs> I mean. Oh. All right. Should we leave it at that note? Yes. I have probably. a question. Sure. So for us going to Bonaire for the first time in saltwater diving, how how long do you wash your gear out so it's safe afterwards? You would rinse it for 15 minutes or so, rinse it pretty good, you know, you'll fill the BCD up with water, rinse that pretty good, rinse the regulators pretty good. Um, with the dust cap on. Yes, dust cap on, correct. So the dust cap, the part in the little top that it would, you would put over the tank and there's a little rubber piece that you shut up there, um, that will keep water of getting uh, into that first stage. And so, then when you get do the same thing again with, so, with the fresh water at home? Yeah, when you get home, throw them in the bathtub. <laughs> yeah, five-gallon pail or the bathtub. So sorry to, to bring it up yet again, uh, the full face mask. I'm thinking specifically for the, the nasal passages. Yes. Because I'm thinking for like Stacia, I had some issues at the end equalizing. Mm -hmm. I'd come back up with a slightly bloody nose. Mm -hmm. Given the fact that you now have air around you, does that make it better, worse, or it's the same? It's the same. Okay. Right. The pressure is going to be the same. Yep. Well, I didn't know just because the, the compressibility, if that make a difference. Well, I, I'm going to give a slightly different different answer. So in general, yes, for clearing, it's the same, right? But, you know, you do have the option to breathe in and out through your nose in a full face mask, right? So mm -hmm. that could help with moving stuff around, okay. right? Pressure absolutely is the same, right? Um, but some people are mouth breathers, some people are nose breathers, right? Yep. And uh, when you first started diving, Right, there's a you, know, you probably felt a little uncomfortable with a mask covering your nose if you were a nose. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a little a little awkward sometimes, and especially when when for me water gets in there and it's just ugh, it yeah. just clogs. So, okay. There you go. The other kind of cool thing with these, uh, Don, do you have yours handy? We're done. Uh, yeah, hold on one second. Okay. So 
there's there's two main manufacturers. This is OTS. This is the one that's preferred by public safety. It's more or less the uh, the standard uh, out there. Um, the function is the same. So one Don has called an Ocean Reef one that's more uh, marketed towards uh, individuals, uh, and it's um, more streamlined, I guess is the way to say it, right? Um, all right, on yours, right? Yes. You um, inside. You, okay, you do have the comms on it. Yep. Yeah. His is prettier. You can see these, <laughs> yeah. here, these buttons are what goes That's against your nose. Okay. So they're really, they're like, they're like a half a marble, rubbery, soft rubbery. Silicone, yeah. Yeah. So what, what this style does is there's just this block sitting there. Right, and if this is more public safety, right, there's a little more training associated with that um, because it's the same for every single person. So if they're deployed in a quick response vehicle or something, you can just grab one and go. With the ocean reef style, it's a little more personalized, right? So where those little uh, silicone nubs sit, you can move around a little bit, and um, it, you can set them a little lower, a little higher, however you want to do them and they could make a, a little tighter seal, right? Uh, Don, on that particular mask, he has a communications unit as well, right? Um, so if you notice the thing that's right in the center of the camera actually is a little push button in front, if you see that, right? That's would be a push to talk. You can set it so it just picks everything up or you can have a push to talk because you know I like diving because people aren't talking to me a lot, right? <laughs> and so, but Jim, um, you can't talk then either. Well, exactly. I quiet. That's why we like diving too, because we can't hear you talk, Jim. <laughs> right. It's everything just quiesces. It's right. Quiesces. And then there's a little earpiece uh, on the side there. The other thing is that in the extender that he has, the part that says Ocean Reef, there's attachment points in there, right? So you can attach things like lights, like GoPros. <laughs> and a bunch of accessories. Uh, that particular one doesn't have it mounted, but there's actually along the, the top of the mask itself, um, there's a light that's built in there, right? So, so we won't lose you under the water. Uh, sorry? So we won't lose you under the water. Uh, th th right. But uh, the idea of that is if you're working, doing something, right? Both hands are free for doing something then, right? Um, so uh, I had it on, on uh, my mask when I had an ocean reef, I switched over OTS, um, and it was great. You have to be very cognizant that you have uh, like a thousand or more than that, like 2,000 lumens on your head. So when you turn to look at somebody, you got to make sure that you're not blinding them. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's point of that. But when, 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 like for the, the commercial use for that is, uh, especially with the comms, um, you know, we had like a sailboat that got hit by lightning, it, it sunk, right? Because of that, we had to put a cradle strap on it, right? When you're reaching underneath and you have, you know, different people on either side and you're trying to feed something through, it's really handy to, to say, no, no, right more, left more, right? Um, but uh, the other use of a comm system is uh, a listen-only mode during a class, Right. Uh, so an instructor would have a comm on and then the students would have just the earpiece on. Right. Uh, so that way, uh, if there's any interesting things to point out or more likely uh, the instructor wants to give instructions. Right. Then you can do that. Right. Um, we looked at it. We figured hand signals would work. <laughs> so, Jim, uh, what about a free flow in a full mask? Ah, so you can get a free flow in, in a mask. So one of the things you have to do is, uh, remember last time we talked about there's dedicated uh, specialty courses for particular pieces of equipment like a dry suit or a full face mask, right? There's a bailout procedure, right? So in, uh, if you have a free flow, right, what you need to do is take the mask off, right? Go to your alternate air source, put your alternate air source in, and then put an alternate mask in. So that's where something like this little kit would come in, right? That you would have it mounted to you. So part of your training, right, is is rip the mask off, air in, reach behind you, get the mask out, mask out, right? Mask over, on, clear, right? And 
you know, it doesn't quite, um, you know, take a, a long time to do. It takes a long time to get second nature at it, <laughs> right? And just like the, uh, the communication, uh, you know, with the headsets I'm wearing now, you know, you can hear me, it's fine. There's some physics involved underwater. And so you actually have to train of how to speak properly and slowly, so it kills me. But um, different, like cow, uh, wouldn't come out like cow. Cow would be, rawr, right? So you have to elongate the vowels. It was a very cow. long day that we took that class together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there, there are bailout uh, techniques you learn. Uh, nice and cold water. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and like little things you learn, like this little thing right here is a vent. Right, so when you're above water, this thing's sealed to your face. This is like having a snorkel on, you know. Um, going underwater, one would think that the mask company would have a one-way check valve in there so water doesn't get in. <laughs> you got to turn it, right? So one of the skills you have to do is, if water gets in, how do you clear it out, right? The answer is you breathe, and it it, it drains out from the uh, the side down here. But so. Stay. How much is a class? Uh, if you get a mass, the class is just built into the price. That leads you to the next question. <laughs> and how much is the mass? <laughs> so for that one, at, with a little extra bells and whistles on the thing, they they list at eight fifty. We sell it for six fifty. So if you think about it, you're getting a second stage as part of that. So you know, it's it's one of those things. Is if you dive a lot, probably worth of investment. You know, if you dive a couple times a year in the Caribbean, probably not. Well, the, the no fogging thing would help. Oh, we didn't talk about that. Thank you. So yeah. the, the other thing is the mass doesn't fog, period. You don't yeah. treat it. It just doesn't fog. Yeah, that'd, be, that'd be nice. Because when you breathe in, air goes across the, yeah. uh, the I mean, uh, panes of glass, and it takes all that humidity away, so you never fog up. You do have to. Make sure your buddy knows how to handle it if you have an emergency. Well, that's, yep, that's exactly part of the class. You're good in all of that. So the mask to mask class. Yeah, so we did, when, when Dan and I did our instructor class for that, we were down in Bonaire, um, and I think we were about at 80 feet. We had to rip the mask off. We had to um, go to, we hit with the, the scenario. Remember this, Don? The scenario is one regulator between two of us. So we were buddy breathing at 80 feet while putting our masks on and all that. So I think that was a bit extreme and not very real world, but it shows that you're comfortable. Exactly. It was, it was good. The talk, I think that part of the class was, was easier than the learning how to talk. Exactly. Right. And there's some systems that are hardwired. I can run down and get the hardwired cable. So the, um, the, um, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the name. Um, I forget the name of the kit, but anyway. So there's a hardwired kit, which means there's actually a physical cable to you. So that cable is used both as a lifeline as well as a communication vehicle. So it's a very thick cable that's normally tied in behind you attached physically, say, to one of these, these hooks to the BC. Maybe it's threaded through something. Um, and then it comes up and through and then connected to the mask. So the, the weight, if you need to be pulled out in an emergency, is attached to your hip, not to your mask, right? And so with that, it's just like we're speaking right now because it's a hard wire. So a lot of times the, um, when the, say, a sheriff's department may be on a recovery for, they have a, on a report of a weapon was tossed into the canal. They're going into black water. They're going to something with a high current, some Genesee, right? They need to be a lifeline on them according to their, their training standards. So that line can act as both a, a lifeline as well as communication. The advantage there is you don't get into the weird physics and how um, sound waves travel, or how electronic signals travel underwater. So. But you're tied down. So what's the rental situation if you want to try it out? I'd assume you need to have the class first. Right, exactly. Okay. Just take the class, Brian. 
Buy well, the he, mask. I asked for that. He said it's not. It's not. Buy, buy the mask. Just do it. <laughs> right. You can test it out next year. <laughs> Indonesia, yes. Well, you know, hold on a second. If you if the if you and an instructor has a full face mask, and you're in a dry suit with dry gloves, <laughs> and you're going underwater, do you have personal protective gear on then? I think you do. Yeah. <laughs> Your instructor doesn't have insurance at the current moment because he's not, the company is not going to cover you. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we only have COVID-18 insurance. Sorry. Oh. You're yeah. the guy that tells me that stuff. That close. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh. Perfect. So. Well, it'd be great to hear if everybody, anybody has different ideas of different classes that they'd like us to do or online while we're in this whole pandemic thing. And I hope everybody stays safe and healthy. I want to do the fish ID course. Oh, Which yeah, one? we'll yeah. get after those. Yeah, yeah, yeah that sounds good. Ecology ID. We Does do that, that include also the, the different hand signals so we can see Jim do sexy shrimp again? I'm not doing sexy shrimp when anything gets recorded. <laughs> I, already, I already have video of it, Jim. Oh, that's true. <laughs> all right. So what that's all about is, is uh, uh, on a lot of these dive trips, um, we may be looking, especially the Asian ones, there's a lot of little teeny critters. Right? And so uh, the, the dive masters, a lot of people like there's bird watchers, where there's like little teeny nudibranch watchers. Right? And so the dive guides go out of their way to write down the name of them, right? And let's just say the, the, the signals and signs that go with them, um, as you get to know people on a trip, maybe change from the first day to the last day. <laughs> yeah. So, Brian, you know, why don't you demonstrate what a, a sexy shrimp would be? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Wait, let me spotlight his video first. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Here, I'll, I'll do it. Hold on. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, I did it. I did it. Wait, wait. Do I have that on this computer, the video of you doing it? All right. Thanks, everyone, for, for coming out. We are over time. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see it on Facebook later. It's all right. There you go. All right. Well, this has been fun. Yeah. There's a nudibrank. In case anybody go. wants to know what we were talking about. Is that one of yours? Yeah. Yeah. That was a quick one I picked up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I love sweet and sour nudibranch. It's delicious. What's the sign for that again? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was that during the Philippines? Mm -hmm. I don't know where that one was from. I just pulled one. <laughs> I mean, this sounds really bad, but, you know, one dive site kind of goes into another. <laughs> But these these things come in all a rainbow of colors. It's amazing the, the differences that nudibranchs come in. You don't have the little crown, that little itsy bitsy one with the green one with the little yellow balls. You don't have that oh, handy, do you? Don't ask me to look for it. <laughs> okay. So so we're we're in uh where was it? That was Indonesia, wasn't it? Yes. It was that was Lemba, I think. So so we're like in eight feet of water after a dive, right next to a highway. There's garbage all over the place because people would just like throw their garbage out the window, right? And there was this, it was kind of muddy. There wasn't, you know, the first part of the dive was great. The last part of the dive is like, okay, the, the dive guide is certainly looking for something. Comes across this little flat rock, right? He's all excited. Oh, come here, 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 come here. Um, and points at this thing. And there is like a dot that's like the size of like you would take a pen and just put a pen on a piece of paper. Just like put a dot and I. And we're like it was, this. It was close to the same size as your laser pointer. Yeah, yeah. And it was just like, okay. And he gets super excited. He writes like the Latin name down for this thing. He's super excited. It's a dot, right? So he makes the picture, the sign of like, take a picture, take a picture. Right? Don's like, whatever. Okay, click. He's like, no, 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 take a picture. So you're like, okay, click, click, click. Right. And we, we don't think anything of it, right? Um, so Don's very disciplined at night after dives. He goes through the hundreds of pictures he's taken that day and starts culling them and picks the ones that are, are interesting versus the ones that are just going to get sent off to the cloud and, you know, just stored and never looked at again. Right. And he's like, M effer, M effer, look at this. And we, we see this thing. It's a blob when he blows it up. 
it's this this green crown like thing with like I think it was like eleven little orange balls on the top of its head, right? And you couldn't see. It. I mean, you blew it up like ridiculously large, right? And it was like like the size of a of a like rice grain or small, probably smaller than a rice grain. It was so, tiny. It was right? The laser pointer. So we asked the guy. We asked the guy, "How'd you possibly find that?" And he said, "Well, you know, I've been doing this a long time. Blah 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 blah." Or that's its entire world. I was just looking for the rock. <laughs> so I was just looking for the rock. So um, that was right. like this little guy. I have um, a question. Who spotlight you? That was a tiny little frogfish. He was a tiny little speck. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then uh, Rick got him. He was with him for like 20 minutes and took like a billion there pictures. There you go. And that oh, thing yeah. was like so tiny. And then he got oh. that and we're like, oh my God, that's a frogfish. It was crazy tiny. Right. Yeah, sometimes it's like, I don't know what that is, click, and you know, 80% of the time it's just going to be a hunk of seaweed or something. But I couldn't even see it with the magnifying glass. It was so tiny. Really? <clears throat> yeah. Wow. I was like, okay, yeah, I'll take your word for that. that that's a frogfish. The instructor, I mean, the guide obviously pointed it out, but I was like, holy cow. When Rick got a picture and showed us, I was like, that's what we saw? <laughs> that's cool. That was insane. That's, so that's very cool. In station, I think it took me uh, at least three or four dives before I found one of the baby drumfish. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, those were tiny. Tiny, tiny. I love them. Those were hard to get a photo of. They were well, you so got a video on them. Moving. Yeah, they come out better if you video because they move so fast. Nudie. There's a nudie, yep. Nice. Nudie. Oh, cool. Yeah, there's a lot of nude ranks. So the ecology, that should, that's not wouldn't be a bad way to go. Um, you just have to pick which, which specialty everybody would want to do. It well, I've, I've, to, I've heard fish and I've heard coral ID. Yeah. Could be done. Yes. Yep. All right, so we'll start okay. planning those. Let me do the test results update on your um, SSI site. Well, sorry, Peggy, could you say that again? Didn't quite hear that. When you're done with the test, when does it reflect on the site? Uh, should be fairly quickly. Um, let me log in. So the work process we've been using to get people certified is I log in, um, you know, I mean, once a day in the morning and um, then uh, Dave has been doing the most of the work, fantastic, and just checking, you know, dotting I's, crossing T's on things, and uh, uh, then uh, issues a certification from there. So let me check, Patty. How many people are done? I'm done. Good. Uh, 15 or so. Nice. All right, Patty, what it says is that you are done with review questions 15 out of 16. And I've seen that be very common. Look at the end of chapter questions and make sure you haven't skipped one. The site's been acting a little wonky too the last couple of days. Yes, yes. So it, it could has. be where yeah. nothing was, was recorded even though you submitted it. It keeps like not letting me move on the book around like yeah, 9 20 p.m. Hmm. That could be because it's been given away for free and everyone's hammering it. Yeah, yeah, I'm thinking yeah, everyone okay. must be on at that time. Jim, I have a question that's slightly off topic, but still on SSI. Sure. Um, when we go on to take this class, we can see our nitrox. Yep. And it says we're 44% done, but we've already done it, taken the test, gotten the certificate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's check into that, shall we? Yeah. Is it like a nitrox? Two or a second course, Jim? Well, so uh, there's a part A and a part B, as it were, right? 
So there's the up to 32% and they don't get into calculating different mixtures. And then uh, there's the, uh, the second part, which you can then calculate, you know, uh, you know at 28%, what's your maximum operating depth and those type of things. Um, huh. um, uh, so it, it could be, but we normally, when we teach it, we do both parts. Uh, let me see, certification card archive. It shows me that you are 100%. Oh, okay. Well, I'll send you a picture of it another time, just so okay. you can tell me if it's okay. And we're still having trouble with updating our dive number on there, but we'll deal with that when we're not. Okay, so I checked the other day, and that's what I saw, the number you sent in. You're not seeing that? No, I'll send you a picture. We'll deal with it another time. Okay. So it was... What question we still have left? Do a convert to showing the same thing. I'm sorry, I was just looking at that. Yeah, no. So, so Chelsea, just back to your. Sorry, Pay. Um, back to you, Chelsea. So, the number you told me the other day—that is what I see, and I'm pulling it from the server in Germany. Okay. So it's probably a sync error. Probably. Right. And uh, so, you, by the way, your last name still your maiden name. Yeah, that's whatever. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I can't change that. Um, it, you have to send a request in to like, um, oh, it's like SSI USA or USA and Dive SSI.com, I think it is. Do I need to change it or can it stay? No, my... you don't need to change it. Okay. Um, right. and we uh, Eric, are... that's not a good sign, man. <laughs> <laughs> Giving myself an out. Um, <laughs> do we? We are now a certified. Right. Can we? Oh yeah. Okay, Eric. Never mind. I have to email you the picture, Jim. I have yeah. Done it. Yeah. Just uh, if anyone wants to add non-SSI certifications mm -hmm. to their SSI account, um, I thought you could do it. No, I have to do it. Um, so if you want that, just uh, you know, shoot a picture of your certification card over to Jim at RU for scuba two ways. Um, and uh, I, can, uh, I can just add that in manually. And you wanna do that before you start adding in all your dives, right? Uh, yeah, so what happens is, uh, so for the, especially the, uh, the, uh, the awards, especially in advance and those type of things, um, it calculates it when you add a dive. So what I normally do is I'll just bump your dives by one. So. And Jim? Yes. Uh, instead of uh, taking a photograph of every one of my certification cards from a different agency, can I just take a screenshot of the, uh, all of them are going to be PADI, the PADI page that shows all of those certifications? Sure. So, so what, what you need, I need to verify you have, you know, you, you have a card, so that would work because it's from PADI. Uh, I would need the certification number, um, the certifying instructor with their PADI number and the organization that they teach through. So like, you know, Bob's School of Dive or whatever, and then the, that shop number. So as long as all that stuff's on the PADI thing, absolutely. Okay, thank thank you. you. I would think it is. Uh oh, someone's not happy. Uh, the doorbell just rang. Oh, there you go. Again. Well, there's a, a a short in the ring doorbell that when the outside pole lamp turns on automatically, it rings the doorbell. So every night he goes ah. crazy and goes barking upstairs. That's funny. He barks at the door. <laughs> We're saying goodbye. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, great. I think our work here may be done. That was a great night. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah, you all. Thank you, everybody. So I'll try to get I'll try to get the Noah diver uh, sometimes next week. It gives us time to figure out how we're going to do the ecology stuff amongst ourselves. Then how would I go about finding out what question I still have left? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I can't see which question is an answer. It just says there's 15 out of 16 questions that were answered. Um, what did you do? Uh, let me see for both you guys. Both the same way. 
I know someone else had that problem, and it was, um, I think, Dave, help me out. I don't know if you helped them or I helped them. But it wasn't it related to they were doing it on one of the apps, and they didn't hit, like, the end button or something like that. They just closed out of the app. Well, if you get done with the tent, this, you know, the, the tent set of questions, it won't let you go on any further. Um, yeah, so, so what happened is, it, well, there's two ways we could do this, right? We could spend time figuring this out. Um, the standard that in order to achieve certification is you finish the final exam. The final exam is built into, into the app nowadays or into the website nowadays, but it doesn't let you, I don't get notification that you finished it unless you finish the review questions as well. Or I could just send you a PDF file of the exam. <laughs> And you could you can answer it by hand just like we always used to do. Either way would work. Anyone else get that issue with that that uh, they, that you're getting stuck on the last question? Anyone else here? Yeah, I had that problem as well, and I uh, sent the email to you, which what made it to Dave, and Dave said uh, something about having to fill out paperwork and okay, so that, which I did. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's. I think sometimes it's just just a sync thing too, because Don, I think Let me for do that, you, yeah. I I checked and it it, it said a hundred percent for you. Okay, I'm fine yeah. with it. <laughs> yeah, so so the way SSI worked with the Scuba Schools International, when you work, when you you get a course issued by a local entity. So in our case, it's SSI USA, right? You're on their servers, right? What I'm seeing is I'm pulling reports off of the master servers that happen to be in Germany. And so every once in a while, they just sync up, mm -hmm. right? And so it, it could be that uh, there's just an error with syncing back and forth. Um, I mean, we can go back to the old-fashioned way of paper for the final. There's, uh, that's about it. But, yeah, so I just, I just hit refresh uh, to reload uh, live results. And so the German servers for you guys are still 15 out of 16. So um, the, you could go to the end of each chapter and just go through that Quizlet again. Right. Um, I know what they did is they've changed the standards. In the past, the end of chapter quizzes um, had to be completed, right? Now, because they're allowing the online uh, final exam, you have to get the correct answer. Right, so if you miss the answer, I'm like, oh, I meant to answer B, but I hit C. I get what's going on. You hit next. It doesn't record that as a correct answer. That could be going on as well. All right, we'll go through it. Yep. I mean, if don't spend more than ten minutes on it, it's stuck. Then we'll just I'll send you a PDF of the final. All right. Anyone else? Okay. We spent enough time in front of our monitors tonight. <laughs> Thank you again. Great job, Thank everyone. You. All right, Thank take you. care, all. Thanks. See you soon. Yep. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. bye.